This is the JWN Podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Meanstead. Welcome to episode number 35. This is a solo show. It's just me talking to you. If you're looking for an interview, check out on Monday. This past Monday, we had an awesome interview with Pip the Pansy. I had a lot of fun talking to her. And you know what's funny is we kept talking for a long time after we recorded that. So it, I probably could have done a two-parter out, out of it. Hey, what can you do? She had a very interesting um, take on religion, which, I, it, you know, I was not expecting that. I didn't, I just didn't know. And, and you can't assume, like, people are going to be a certain way. And uh, she's a very spiritual person. And you know, her views on how religion is basically saved her life and it kind of reminded me of uh, something that was going on at work for me around the same time. I had a customer who sent an email com- complaining about a bill. Basically, he was upset that somebody that works for me had done some work for him and he, he had done it quickly and efficiently. And he took care of the problem. And according to the customer, it only took him 10 minutes to solve the problem. And he got charged for a full hour. And so he was upset by that. And, you know, I explained to him, I was like, you know, if you have a problem with the bill, just contact me and I'll I'll work with you on it. But the way he came at it, I I had to explain to him why we charge the way we charge and why is it worth an hour's worth of work for 10 minutes worth of work and why, you know, that first hour is always billed at an hour. You know, for any of you in the creative industry or in the service industry, you know what that means. That first hour is covering all the uh, uh, costs of of being able to do that work. And you're also paying for the knowledge of the person that's performing the work. Because if you had the knowledge to do it, you wouldn't have called for help. So in my, it's my opinion that when someone fixes something quickly and efficiently and does the right thing, that's a good thing. I'm not going to be upset. I'm not going to feel ashamed. So he wrote this angry letter saying he's paid it but he's no longer going to use our services and all this stuff and he's going to tell all his friends and yada 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 so then i wrote back a nice long thoughtful email explaining all those things i just said in a much more professional way and then he replied back nice form letter and i was like oh my gosh i just spent like 20 minutes constructing this email and like really going over it and forwarding it to uh, another person for them to read it, make sure it doesn't sound aggressive or mean or make sure it sounds polite and, and informative and whatnot. I guess it was too good because he thought it was a form letter. I don't know. So I, I joked around uh, with people in my office and I was like, you know what, when his, when his money comes in, when his check comes in, let's like donate it to a political campaign because, you know, chances are given the history with this gentleman we could pretty much figure out where his political leanings were you know sometimes you just know although as i just previously said about pip the pansy and her spirituality you cannot assume anything regardless we just had a laugh about it but when when the check did come in i, I took a look at it and i was like I, here are my options i can just tear up the check and never cash it I could send it back to him, but that kind of comes across like a big F you. Or, or, uh, you know what? I can donate to my favorite charity. I could donate to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And that's what I did. And I put it in his name. And then I forwarded the receipt to him. And I said, hey, uh, got your payment. I don't feel right about taking it since you were unhappy with the services we provided. So I donated it to this charity and I put it in your name. Here's the receipt. You can use it to write off of your taxes. The next day I got this email back from him and I swear it was like a whole different human being. I mean, he was as thrilled and happy and apologetic for his response. And and it's so, it's one of those things where, you know, where where if you choose to, to be the, the thing that stops the cycle of vitriol and hatred or just bitterness, uh, sometimes it, it, it spins back the other way and, and then it turns into a cycle of, of kindness. 
so yeah that was a that was kind of a, a fun little thing where where you know instead of doing something to spite somebody doing some something that benefits everybody uh turned out to actually benefit me more than i had hoped i i wasn't planning on getting this guy's business back or impressing him i just really wanted to do what was right and so i i guess that kind of worked so how about that debate? I mean, can you believe what he did, what he said? I can't believe that. I mean, you kind of expect it, but then to go there, oh, it's unbelievable. I, I'm talking out my ass. I'm recording this right before the debate starts because I don't have time to record it after the debate. So I'm just assuming something awful will happen. Hopefully, um, nobody gets a gun pulled on them. <laughs> Because that would be, that would be on brand at this point. I mean, the last debate that he did, he literally, he no, there's no way. Listen, because we don't have the evidence in hand, me saying this is all alleged. He allegedly tried to get Joe Biden sick with COVID-19. Because I don't know about you, but to go from... Being in a debate, two days later, you're in the hospital or three days later. Uh, it, it, the timeline doesn't, it just doesn't work. There's no way he didn't know. Come on. And the way they all just paraded in there and and the whole family just maskless, breaking all the rules. They just don't care about rules, period. I mean, it goes to show with what's going on today as I record this, you know, the with the committee that you know, votes on what to do with this justice. I don't even want to say her name. But, oh, it's so upsetting. Uh, but they broke their rules to get it to the vote to the Senate floor, you know, because there had to have been at least two Democrats present in that committee in order for them to move this along. And the, the Democrats boycotted. So you know what they did? They said, who cares? This has been our government for the last few years. It's just like, Oh, that's the law? We don't care. Oh, you're not allowed to campaign on government property? We're going to hold a Republican National Convention at the White House. How about that? You know, I'm sorry. I don't mean to get too political. This is not a political podcast. But some of my news stories today kind of jump right in there. But I'm going to keep it, you know, within the, within the creative realm. But I mean... Trump did accuse the Biden presidency this week of 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 uh, of believing in science or believing scientists like that's a bad thing. Uh, he, this is actually what he said. He said he'll listen to the scientists. He said at the Klan. I mean, I'm sorry, the campaign rally in Carson City, Nevada. Then he added, "If I listened totally to the scientists, we would, I can't do an impression. We we would." We would right now have a country that would be in a massive depression instead of, we're like a rocket ship. Take a look at the numbers. I mean, I assume he's talking about like the stock market, which by the way, most people, it's the worst gauge of how the economy is doing. Stock market's been doing amazing during this whole pandemic while people are like unable to pay their bills and are getting evicted. Um, yeah, but saying like we're we're like a rocket ship take a look at those numbers right after you're talking about believing scientists about a pandemic uh it's an odd choice of words considering that coronavirus cases uh have reached the highest levels since july and right now we're on our way to the third peak odd choice of words odd choice of words but carl sagan once said science is a way to call the bluff of those who only pretend to have knowledge. <laughs> it can tell us when we're being lied to. It provides mid-course correction to our mistakes. In his 1995 masterwork, The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark, the source of his indispensable baloney detection kit, Carl Sagan writes, avoidable human misery is more often caused not so much by stupidity as by ignorance, particularly our ignorance about ourselves. Whenever our ethnic or national prejudices are aroused, in these times of scarcity, during challenges to national self-esteem or nerve, when we agonize about our diminished cosmic place in our purpose, or 
when fanaticism is bubbling up around us, then habits of thought familiar from ages past reach for their controls. Sound familiar? Kind of like, make America great again. Well, enough of that. Let's get to the news. For our first story tonight, or today, whenever you're listening to this, now, Shepard Ferry once again has the cover of Time Magazine. This is the first time that they haven't had the logo for Time Magazine on the cover. They replaced it with the word vote in the same kind of Time Magazine font. Um, But this is the first time in in nearly 100 years that they've done that. And uh, this is why they did it. They said, to mark this historic moment, arguably as consequential a decision as any of us has ever made at the ballot box, we have for the first time in our nearly 100 year history replaced our logo on the cover of our U.S. edition with the imperative for all of us to exercise the right to vote. The help we provided readers with a guide on how to vote safely during this extraordinary year. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm going to interject here. If you don't know how to vote at this point, you can't open up your phone without it telling you how to vote. You turn on the TV, it tells you how to vote. I swear, if you go to the bathroom in a public area, there's probably a piece of paper in the urinal, like in the little cake that you pee into. <laughs> that makes it so it doesn't splash. That tells you how to vote. I mean, at this point, you better know how to vote. It's, it, the time's ticking, man. <laughs> There's no excuses, but it is kind of like at this point, you know, you're you're like overwhelmed by it. You're like, all right, I get it. I, I need to vote. The artwork on the cover is by Shepard Ferry, as I already said, whose work includes two prior Todd magazine covers. And Shepard had this to say, even though the subject in the portrait knows there are additional challenges to democracy during a pandemic, the person is determined to use their voice and power by voting. Moving along. We got more TikTok news for you. In 2016, the ambient musician known as The Caretaker, whose real name is Leyland James Kirby, began incrementally releasing a masterpiece known as Everywhere at the End of Time. The album, which eventually ran to six hours in length, was divided into six stages. As the album progresses, each stage gets increasingly degraded. The recognizable melodies get chewed up. There's more interference, more noise. Eventually, by the sixth stage, the album becomes a mess of horror and chaos, eventually plateauing into a long, fuzzy wave of sound. And that's because Everywhere at the End of Time is not just an album. It's a creative replication of what happens when you begin to lose your memories. The final stages of Everywhere has been out for over a year, and the project started almost half a decade ago. Which is why it's quite surprising that the record has found a new audience in TikTok. TikTok users have turned the experience of listening to everywhere into a kind of challenge, with some encouraging friends to see how much of the album they can get through before giving up. In turn, the trend has inspired some pushback, with a few users arguing that uh, that turning the work into a mere challenge reduces its power and offends those with dementia. I kind of disagree with that. I I, I think uh, turning it into a challenge and making it aware, it's going to force people to really think about it. You know, you're going to have people who just do it and go along with it and, and they're, they're, it's going to go over their head. But you're going to have a lot more people getting the message and the intended message of that piece of work. And they're going to be turned on to that. And they're going to become very much more aware of it. And they're going to be understandably struggling with how awful that could be, what a nightmare that would be. And uh, yeah, so I think overall, that bravo to TikTok users. That's, uh, that's two. I'll give them two. <laughs> Disrupting a rally and uh, bringing awareness to uh, this piece of art. I think that's kind of a cool challenge. Uh, even, even if people go about it for the wrong reasons, there's somebody out there who will get it for the right reasons. And that, that's fantastic. That's artwork. Darn it! (laughs) Okay. For our next story, we're going to talk about Sasha Baron Cohen because everyone wants to talk about Sasha Baron Cohen. Uh, He's got a new movie that's coming out. Actually, it'll be out when this podcast drops, I think on Friday, uh, October 21st. In the new film, the former New York mayor, Rudy Giuliani, 
uh, former presidential candidate and now personal lawyer to Donald Trump, is seen reaching into his trousers and apparently touching his genitals while re reclining in a bed in the presence of an actor playing Borat's daughter who's posing as a TV journalist. Following an interview for a fake conservative news program, the pair retreat at her suggestion for a drink in the bedroom of a hotel suite, which is rigged with concealed cameras everywhere. As she removes his microphone, Giuliani, who's 76 at the time, can be seen laying back on his bed, fiddling with an untucked shirt and reaching down into his trousers. They're then interrupted by Borat, who runs in and says, she's 15, she's too old for you. <laughs> uh, I'm laughing at a pedophile joke. <laughs> this is what the world has come down to. Um, <laughs> word of the incident first emerged in July when Giuliani called New York police to report the intrusion of an unusually dressed man. This guy comes running in wearing a crazy, what I would say, a pink transgender outfit, Giuliani told the New York Post. It, it was a pink bikini with lace underneath a translucent mesh top. It looked absurd. He had the beard, bare legs, and wasn't what I would call an attractive woman. The person comes in yelling and screaming, and I thought this must be a scam or a shakedown, so I reported it to the police. Then he ran away, Giuliani said. The police found no crime had been committed. Giuliani continued, I only later realized it must have been Sasha Baron Cohen. <laughs> I thought about all the people he'd previously fooled and felt good about myself because he didn't get me. <laughs> Viewers may be less convinced that Baron Cohen, reprising his role as the bumbling reporter Borat, and M Maria Bakalova, who plays his daughter, Tutar, had no success. <laughs> guess the proof is in the film huh oh boy you know what's funny you know what's funny is the projection that goes on with these these kinds of people you know he's got this like so-called laptop that he's saying claiming that that some some very <laughs> just an awful it person or repair tech or whatever the hell he's claiming to be says this must be Hunter Biden's laptop instead of calling the police or calling the FBI or anyone besides Donald Trump's lawyer. He calls Rudy Giuliani and gets the laptop to Rudy Giuliani. And then Rudy Giuliani basically asserts that there's like nasty child porn stuff going on on this laptop. Hmm. Yeah child porn on the laptop and you thought you were in a damn room with a young woman with your hand down your pants caught with your hand down your pants the difference between this and the laptop is uh yeah this whole thing is on on tape you got filmed being a creep i don't know man i does anything shock you anymore i mean we live in the weirdest times ever because we have this information. We can see it. It's so transparent. But there are so many, there are enough people that don't believe what they see and they don't care. And they're just like, no, this is all sounds great. No problem. Yes, Rudy's a good guy. America's mayor. He's not totally in bed with Russia uh, try in Iran apparently uh, to trying to make up dirt on Joe Biden's only surviving son. Uh, let's talk about something better. Let's talk about something nice. This will be a quick one. Velvet Underground has a new documentary coming to Apple TV. According to a press release, The Velvet Underground will feature interviews with key players as well as a treasure trove of never before seen performances and a rich collection of recordings, Warhol films, and other experimental art. Ah, I'm excited for that. I'm excited. I think the last thing I watched on the Apple TV platform was the Beastie Boys documentary. They've really been like lame with a lot of their original programming. I shouldn't even say that because I just don't even watch it. But 
Uh, I will be watching this. And for our last story, let's keep it on the upswing here. Let's talk about music. Let's talk about probably the greatest hip-hop duo of 2020, Run the Jewels. Today, as I record this, this is just, just topical for me right now. They shared a new video for their opening song on the Run the Jewels 4, Yankee and the Brave, episode 4. It's a, an animated video, and it's directed by Sean Solomon and animated by Titmouse. That's a cool name. Anyway, better than Mouse Tit. Uh, it finds cartoon versions of Killer Mike and LP getting chased by robot police. Chris Pranowski, who's the president and founder of Titmouse, said in a statement, Killer Mike and LP would fuck up some robot cops in real life. So I consider the animated music video for Yankee and the Brave a documentary that documents the future. The prophecy of Run the Jewels has flowed through the Titmouse animators' hearts and into their pencils. You can watch it before it happens as magical, moving drawings. You know what? It's pretty pretty awesome, and I kind of wish it was an actual... uh, TV show because <laughs> it, it looks cool like the little animated LP pulling out like a bag of mushrooms it, 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 it's funny it's good I'll put a link to it in the show notes as well as a link to their get out the vote concert that they did last week so they performed the album RTJ4 in its entirety for the first time in an event called Holy Kalama Vote And it was put on by uh, Adult Swim and Ben and Jerry's. And it was encouraging fans to register to vote as well as support the ACLU. During a live stream, Killer Mike and LP were joined virtually by many of R2J4's guests on Just. Both Pharrell Williams and Rage Against the Machine, Zach De La Roca, appeared via video for their respective verses, while Mavis Staples and Josh Holm showed up like apparitions on Pulling the Pin. Eric Andre served as the MC for the event, briefly interrupting the performance at times to play the role of a telephone host. The performance on that whole thing that stood out the most for me was Walking in the Snow. It was just such a powerful, uh, it was a, it was a powerfully staged performance, but the whole thing in general made me like feel really, really sad for a little bit. You know, I'm happy that we got this. I'm happy that they gave this to us. We get to see that, which is fantastic. But I, I was supposed to go see Run the Jewels. You know, I had bought tickets to go see them in Washington, D.C. Uh, with opening for Rage Against the Machine. And it was one of those concerts I was like, just so excited. It was one of those things that when that happened, when when that was announced and I got my tickets, I was, I was just like, oh, and choosing the place to go was such an important decision. And I was like, you know what? If we go to Washington, D.C., weed is decriminalized there. So I was very, like, very much, you know, strategic in my planning on where to go see Run the Jewels because I haven't seen them live. I've missed them on every time that they're somewhere I could go see them. I have been either out of the country out of state, out of town, whatever it may be. I've never been able to get to see them. And I was pissed that I couldn't see them. Obviously. Pissed for a lot of reasons. But like the the, the different music things that were going on this year, that I was, uh, the, the, the tickets to events that I had, and just watching them like one by one go, get canceled, and you're just like, oh God, this is, this is awful. This was probably... This was number one. This was the one I was most excited for. And uh, yeah, it hurt. But we do get to have this video. I I don't know if they're ever going to pull it. It's available on YouTube, on HBO Max. I'll put a link to it in the show notes um, for the whole... It's the whole album. They're playing it live. It sounds great. I think it might actually sound... I don't know. It might be my TV, but I think it sounds better when I watch it on YouTube because the music is louder. I think my TV is trying to like artificially boost... The vocals because it thinks that I want to hear people talking more than music, which is when I'm watching a show or a movie or something like that. It's usually true. You sometimes, sometimes I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm not ashamed to tell you that there's some shows that I put the uh, subtitles on 
because the the music and the sound effects are so loud that I'm like, what do you say? Huh? What do you say? I hope you have a fantastic week. I am going to tell you right now that I have an amazing young person. I say young. I don't even know how old she is. She seems young to me. <laughs> so stupid. I am so stupid. Anyway, I recorded an interview with Emily Helen, who is a YouTuber, and she's an athlete. She's a runner. She just started her YouTube channel last year, and it's growing very quickly. She's doing really good things, and I didn't know anything about her because her her TV her TV her YouTube channel is so specific to like just running shoe reviews that's pretty much what she does on it. she does talks about shoes but like anything with youtube the more you watch somebody do something the more you get like you pick up on little things and you start to get to know them sort of like the, you know you know like life just seeps in and so i kind of wanted to get to know you know what her background was and i was pleasantly surprised and you would be too So check it out on Monday that's going to drop. I hope you have a great weekend. Peace.